Presenting Alexander Herka, artist par excellence, editor of Smegma, colleague of Thule's, creator of amazing works such as this photo montage, Urban Anatomy, which he presented at Burning Man. To Revolting News, my name is Alexander Herka. I'm an artist living in New York City, and I want to thank Thelma for inviting me to sit here and talk. I'm not used to this, so forgive me my uh, whatever. Um, I guess I wanted to start by talking about um, Thule and my connection with Fugs and all of that and life. Um, I grew up on the Lower East Side um, and we eventually moved to Brooklyn and then the Bronx and all throughout that period of time when I was in my early teens I uh, spent most of my money um, on buying 45 RPM records especially after the Beatles came around I was just I was hooked I would go to House of Oldies in the village and uh, I remember having to say five dollars and ten cents with tax for 1045 RPMs and I would always buy whatever new was coming in I didn't even know the stuff I remember the first time they played a Doors record and I was like okay I'll take that I don't know what it is but I bought it and so music's just been this major major thing in my life it still is um, and so as I got older uh, I you know would start going to concerts and one of the concerts that stands out in my mind very powerfully is um, seeing the Fugs at the Fillmore East. It's a show with Moby Grape and uh, the Gary Burton Quartet and I, I remember I used to save the little programs from it and you'd see three four major acts for whatever it was five dollars six dollars and anyway the Fugs were it was just a epiphanous moment. I uh, their combination of politics um, uh, sex uh, poetry, everything coming together, it was in a way that I hadn't seen and very raw and very real as compared to commercial pop and rock and all the rest of that. And that night was just absolutely magical to me and I, you know, I actually looked it up today that it was uh, June 1st, 1967, which is now the Golden Filth album, which is out there on CD. Um, I recommend it. Um, it's still amazingly uh, shocking compared to what's out there um, and 67 was also the um, uh, march in Washington to the Pentagon uh, where I'm not sure if it was all the thugs or if it was just Thule and Ed were there I mean I'm not I'm not exactly sure but um, they did their exorcism at the Pentagon which I missed because I my bus broke down somewhere in Delaware um, but the Fugs were a major part to me musically at that point. Um, I would buy everything they were putting out and just loved all of it. Um, and it was years later, um, my connection with Thule, uh, the personal connection, was through a magazine that I was doing at the time uh, called Smegma, Smegma the Magazine, which I actually think the first time that I heard that word creatively, other than in some science reference <laughs> book, um, was in the inside of um, It Crawled Into My Hand, Honest, the Fugs album. There is a little poem in there of which one of the lines is, We Wax Weary of Tadpole Smegma. <laughs> and uh, that just stuck in my mind. And for some reason or other, when I was doing the magazine, um, I had a partner at the time um, who called herself St. Scarlatina Lust. Um, and the two of us put the magazine together. And I don't remember how Thule ended up in the magazine. Um, I know we ended up going to his house. He, you know, showed us artwork. He was just ridiculously gracious. I mean, he was so supportive. So, like, you guys are doing something? Here, let me help you in any way I can. Um, and so we had his cartoons in, um, I think, the first three issues. Uh, we did 500 of the first one, then 1,000 of the next three issues. Um, the first one is now completely, I mean, you can't find it, basically. It's kind of disappeared. Um, the other ones are still around. And, um, yeah, it was just, it was a, it was a labor of love. We had a, um, a printing house in Chelsea that really enjoyed 
doing it because they basically had regular print jobs that they did and it was an opportunity for them to play too. It was like you come in with this magazine, you want to mix colors, you want to do this, you want to do that, you have crazy cartoons and uh, so it was also it was a creative process all the way around and at that time I was also linked in with the Mail Art Network. Um, it's kind of hard to explain, look it up, Google it. Um, it's a network of artists all around the world who exchange mail, um, artwork through the mail. Um, the history is, you know, as all art histories is kind of mixed. Uh, Ray Johnson is one of the first people who's kind of mentioned in that. And a lot of these artists were sort of linked to him or uh, John Evans from the Lower East Side um, was a big part of it. So I became friends with all of these people, especially in New York, and E.F. Higgins, um, and so all these people contributed to the magazine. It was a very nice, energetic, local thing. Uh, the bookstore that's gone now on Spring Street uh, was also mm -hmm. very, very supportive. They just loved that there were local people doing this fun thing. They would put it in the front window, which was kind of wonderful. Um, for the third issue, we did um, an audio montage, which I pretty much mixed by myself. Uh, other people contributed stuff, but I, I do collage, photo montage, and this was just another opportunity to do that kind of thing except with audio stuff. So uh, we, in the third issue, had a free flexi disc, one of those little flat records that, uh, uh, which was called Hot Dog You Bet, which was a little sound bite from um, the Chipmunks record where Theodore <laughs> says, Hot Dog, You Bet! <laughs> so we took that clip and I interspersed it throughout. Um, I just reminded, we actually put it on the back of one of the covers. We went out one night and, pa and spray painted Hot Dog, You Bet on the four corners of, um, what is that, uh, Spring and, I want to say LaGuardia, no, it's the other. Sixth Avenue? No, no. one block down. Uh, in Soho. I mean, it's the main drag in Soho. Broadway? West Broadway? West Broadway. West Broadway. Yeah, West Broadway. Um, yeah, we went out and painted that. I mean, it was just a, a very creative period with a lot of energy. And, you know, I remember going to Tully's house and, you know, him showing us the artwork. And as I was mentioning before, I have this, you know, my memory is, is fading. But I have this great image of being in his house, sitting, talking with him, and that there was a wall as big as I've ever seen of books. Mm -hmm. That one is, you know, like, like I said, my imagination's probably stretched it now, but it seemed like forever of, of books. And that's just such a wonderful... Do you have a copy of the magazine to show us? Um, we'll, we'll, we'll try to zoom in. And, and, and. Uh, well, I don't have number one. Like I said, they're yeah. extremely rare, but... Uh, All right. Here's uh, number two with a picture it, of uh, we went out to uh, Greenwood Cemetery in Brooklyn. That's where Thule is now. Right. That's funny. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> um, and we attached this little shopping bag and a big smiley mouth onto one of the angels uh -huh. and took a photograph. Yeah. Um, and uh, this was number four, our last issue with uh, Einstein on it. And our number three issue, which was the sex issue, which had the uh, flexi disc in it. Mm. Um, so, mm. um, how much was it for a copy? A dollar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And we, you know, we we weren't planning on making money on it. We were hoping that we would, you know, <laughs> just yeah. get a pizza out of it or something. <laughs> or. Right. Uh, it was obviously a labor of love and fun yeah. and all yeah. the rest. I mean, like I said, the energy that we created around it was just... Uh, I don't think any of those actually had them. We we printed up um, the stickers that, um, that you know, businesses use, with little label stickers. Mm -hmm. And we had those for Smegma the magazine, and they would have like an eye on them or something. And we'd go on subways and stick them onto the posters and stuff mm -hmm. so the eye would match up the poster of uh, advertisement for something. And we just... we did. I mean, we felt like we, had, we were covering the city with those. We were just, uh -huh. you know, it was our little uh, uh -huh. external promotion uh -huh. of it. But, uh, um, so yeah, um, trying to think what else. Uh, the mail art stuff I did for about four years. Um, I'm still in touch with a lot of the people. I ended up going to Europe years later 
um, and connecting with some of those people mm -hmm. in Italy and Germany and France that I'd been corresponding with for years. Uh, some were artists, some were just people who were sort of playful with the mail. Um, mm -hmm. Some people have compared it to the internet before there was an internet because it was this network of became friends sharing artwork between each other. Mm -hmm. um, so much easier now. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> but th in some ways that makes it a little less um, involved. You know, when I would, I would go, I used to have a post office in uh, Chelsea near where I worked, and you, you'd go, you know, after work and pick up your mail and there'd be ten pieces of mail from all around the world, yeah. and you always felt like you wanted to return with something really good. I think, you know, with Facebook or anything else, you can just fire stuff off, mm -hmm. you know, it's very, very quick and easy and there's not that much, you know, like sitting down. If you're going to address an envelope and, you know, rubber stamp it and put stickers on it and stuff, you just, you take a different kind of care to it. Uh, on the other hand, it's very time consuming. I spent, you know, felt like I would come home and just work on mail art for years and that just, you know, kind of wore out after a while. Uh, so, uh, historically, after that, I moved to Vermont. Uh, mm. I um, got married. Mm. I, uh, at that point, felt like I had used up the city and just was not using it anymore. What and year was that? 86, 87. Uh -huh. Actually, the thing that's, that was right before that was pretty great is after I got married, the two of us went to Europe for six months and we traveled through 26 countries backpacking. Um, it was an am absolutely amazing adventure. Um, so then I moved to Vermont after that and uh, had three children mm -hmm. and that changes life altogether. Mm -hmm. So uh, I settled down. I, you know, I, um, I raised a family. Mm -hmm. uh, we, I lived in rural areas. I mean like real rural areas. I lived in a small town. Um, I luckily never lived in a suburb. To me, that's the one part that's like, mm -hmm. I don't think I could do. Um, and my kids are great. Um, they're, yeah, they're wonderful. Um, and uh, kind of rolling along, uh, four years ago, I was unemployed for a year and a half. And uh, my kids were growing up and leaving home. One of them was uh, staying with his mom. Um, and so I had a big apartment for all of them at that point. We were separated. Mm -hmm. So we had kids week on, week off. And at that point, I, I didn't need the apartment. And my landlord conveniently came along and said that he needed the apartment. Oh. So I was unemployed and all of a sudden oh. had like two months to move out. So as awful as it was at the time, my, my landlord, I mean, he just needed the apartment. It wasn't a, you know, it wasn't anything really evil. Um, other than the fact he could charge twice as much as he was charging me. But he, uh, he said at that point to me, some, you know, maybe someday you'll thank me for this. And it's a funny thing because I really do. Because it, between unemployment and not having a place, rather than deciding to stay there and try to rebuild my life in Vermont, I did what I'd been wanting to do for years, which was to get back to New York. Mm -hmm. um, this is my psychological home. There's no question mm. about it. It's just, um, it's just, it's the place I want to be. And so it turned out for the best. I mean, I moved here and um, got a little room in Brooklyn with a bunch of roommates because that seems like the only way you can live in New York unless mm -hmm. you're lucky. Mm -hmm. um, and kind of, you know, started rebuilding my life. I was unemployed for at least another, almost another year here. Um, and you, and when did you start creating these photo montages? Um, well, I've been doing some variation of them for from when I was living in New York before. So it's been decades I've been doing photo montage of some sort. Um, once I, I'm trying to think, in 2005, it's kind of another whole big episode of my life. Yeah. In 2005, um, I needed something in my life. I needed a charge in my life. I needed a quick change. I needed something. And out of nowhere, I discovered about the event out west called Burning Man. Mm. And um, so, I, um, strangely enough, I'd never rented a car before on my own. 
I'd never flown on my own. I'd never camped by my own. I'd, none of these things. And that year I did all of it. I flew myself out to California, rented a car, bought a tent, set up mm -hmm. a tent, all the stuff that, that I'd never done. And I was in the middle of what I consider, other than New York, my only other home. I mean, it's, it's, it's such an energizing, creative place that, um, well, that I've now gone nine years in a row. All right, this tell is, us about Burning Man for people who don't know. I hear it's going to be in September again. It's in, it's in, uh, it's on, uh, what, what's that, Labor Day weekend, yeah. pretty much, for a week. Yeah. Um, it's been going on for 25 years, or 20-some years. It started in San Francisco, uh, and a group of artists uh, brought this figure of a man to the middle of uh, the beach in San Francisco and burnt it. Does it have and to do with Wicker Man? No, it, no. It, it actually just, you know, was one person's thing to do, yeah. and it's kind of grown out of it. I mean, it obviously has similarities yeah. to it, but... Um, and, um, you know, after a couple of years, San Francisco said, you can't, the crowds grew bigger and bigger. You can't be doing this thing on a public beach. So yeah. they went in search of, um, of another place to do it. And the people who went out there looking for it came across this, the Black Rock Desert, um, which is about 100 miles out of Reno, which is nothing. I mean, it's dead. It's, it's a lake bed. Um, that in the summer is just desert. There's no life on it whatsoever, not even insects or cactus so or anything. where do you get water and food? You have to bring everything, which is one of the, the great things about the event is you have to bring everything you need to survive for a week. And at the end of the event, I mean, there are volunteers who stay a month afterwards, but at the end of the event, uh, if you went there a month after, there'd be no trace that it ever happened. Mm -hmm. And while it's there, this year it's going to be 70,000 people, which makes it like the third largest city in Nevada. Um, you know, I, I recommend anyone who's at all even interested in knowing what it's about, either do Wikipedia, which will give you information, or just go to YouTube and put it in as far as videos go, and you'll see. It's just, uh, it's, it's, it's a magical thing. Um, and it's getting bigger and bigger, and as a result, you know, the people who went there the earlier years um, kind of regret. There was a lot more freedom. When it was a thousand people or two thousand people, you had a lot of freedom. There were things like people supposedly drove, they had drive-by shooting ranges. Mm -hmm. So people would drive their cars and shoot their guns. And obviously once you get to twenty, thirty thousand people, you just can't do that. So, um, I mean, it's a very, very organized thing. They go out there a month in advance. There are streets that are marked off. It's done in a circle and there are streets marked off and, um, you know, there's security, there's internal uh, security. A state of Nevada has police there, so it's also uh, all the bad things that can happen with police happen there. There are drug busts, there are, you know. Yeah, does everybody bring their own artwork? Does everyone have something to contribute? Well, the goal is to participate, you know, the, it's kind of, there are 10 <clears throat> standards, 10 things that, that uh, it strives for that have come up over the years. And participation is a major aspect of that. There are other things like um, that everyone can be included. I mean, I went the first, whatever it was, four years. I mean, a lot of it is major artwork. I mean, big structures, yeah. fire, things. I've seen, and, I've seen pictures. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the first few years I went, I kept looking, you know, well, I do these photo montages. How does that, what do I do with it? And it took me that long to realize that in the center cafe, they have a little um, camp type thing in the middle, which as, as a side note, nothing at this event is sold whatsoever. I mean, there's no money involved. They actually, you can, you can buy coffee and you can buy ice. But other than that, there's no commerce whatsoever, which is another wonderful thing. For that week, you don't barter, you don't deal with cash. Mm. You bring what you have, and if you have stuff, you share it. You gift mm. it. You get it back. Um, but uh, I was going to say the artwork, you know, there is a whole center camp part where they have artwork. Regular, you know, sort of flat, one-dimensional artwork to hang up. And it took me that many years of going there and going, wait, wait a minute, I do stuff like this. And that's what kind of got me doing like some of these larger pieces that mm -hmm. I have mm -hmm. because Can I, I show them. Okay. Sure, I'd like to, to 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 show some of these incredibly complex and detailed and interesting photo montages. There's one. 
and there's another. There's the two. the bigger ones came from the from Burning Man. I always did smaller pieces, but all of a sudden I had these large spaces where I could show my stuff. So I started doing these bigger pieces. That's from last year. Um, what are they called, and what are they about? The pieces. Yeah. Oh uh, well, uh, this one was called. Oh dear. Uh, well, it had to do with gullibility. Uh, last year's theme, they have a theme every year uh -huh. to help the artists come up with with stuff. And last year's was cargo cults. I don't know if you uh -huh. know about cargo cults. Yeah, I sort of do. I, um, and one of the things that struck me, which is what I went, went with this piece, is that um, sort of people's gullibility. Um, you know, the, the cargo cults think that someone's going to come and save them yeah. and bring them things. And this was kind of my idea of... Um, the way religions do in mm. general think somebody's going to come and save us somebody's going to bring us uh -huh. something um, expecting something from outside to come and and save or provide so um, right and, and you think it should come from yourself right yeah yeah I mean it, there's there isn't it's someone uh, who's going to come and do it for you no. <laughs> um, did you have a religious upbringing well I went to Catholic school for uh, ten years, eight years of uh, yeah, at St. George Ukrainian Catholic on Seventh Street. Right. Um, then I went to two years of high school. Then I went to public school, um, and uh, I always was an unbeliever, or at least considered myself agnostic or something, or atheist. And then, strangely enough, in my midlife, I think it was my midlife crisis or something, early on, I had a five-year Catholic moment in my life. Mm -hmm. um, I blame Dorothy Day and uh, the Berrigans and... Uh, Thomas Merton? Merton and even even the people like <laughs> Chesterton. Um, well, they're and, good and bad of all kinds. They're good Catholics. Yeah, and, well, I mean, they were thinkers. You know, they were yeah. smart people and a lot of the things that they believed in, so did I. I mean, I had already come from a sort of anti-war um, background, mm -hmm. so all this stuff fit my life, and yeah. next thing you know, I was uh, I was a Catholic. Uh -huh. um, that lasted for almost exactly five years. It, it felt like it came on as a drug, like some brain chemicals I was able to believe, mm -hmm. and then the same way it left. All of a sudden, it, it just slowly trickled away, and all of a sudden I was like, what am I believing here? Huh. So I'm back to... Uh, being an atheist and probably a little bit more uh, rapidly so. Yeah. Um, well, there are no Berrigans and Merton around at, the, at this time. <laughs> that's true. And there's nobody leading the Catholics, I think. That, no. Uh, and no I, radical Catholic, at least. No, I and I, I actually constantly am picking on the new Pope because everybody seems to be thinking that he's some sort of you know, wonderful hope for the Catholic Church, and I just, I think he's learned how to do marketing better. Oh. I think the Church has just learned how to be cooler and say the right kind of things, but if it comes down to it, they're not about to change any of the real things that I have a problem with, you know? They're, uh, so, um... Mm -hmm. Well, so... What what are you thinking now? What what are, what are you into at the moment? Well, I'm doing this artwork, um, and what's uh, happened since uh, well now four years ago. Let's see if I can get this. Where is this? Yeah, go ahead. Keep talking. Oh, okay. Um, well, about. Uh, Trying to say, think about three years ago, whatever. I'm, I'm very bad at time, but it's uh, okay. I, uh, when I moved back to Brooklyn, um, not too long after that, I came back from Burning Man and I met my current partner, mm. Tammy Remington, mm -hmm. who is a writer. Yeah. And uh, that's been a real major thing in my life because the, the, the creativity and everything else between us is just really, really powerful. Um, we um, have our own blog, which for the most part has been her writing a story and me doing some image that's not really, um, that's not really related to the story, mm -hmm. but kind of goes with the feeling of it. 
Um, so we're doing a lot of work like that together, trying to do a lot of work like that while maintaining regular jobs. And Yeah, and you have a presence on Etsy. I've seen it. I've seen yeah. these beautiful uh, pictures. Yeah, I try. Uh, yeah. I also, I think as well, uh, many, many artists, I, I don't have any business. I don't have <laughs> the selling knack. I don't, yeah. you know, uh, I know people who do. Uh, and you know they end up in galleries and selling mm -hmm. and making money, but mm -hmm. they um, they look to me like museum pieces. Some of these. Oh, thank you. They're really wonderful. Yeah. Um, and uh, one other thing that I just remembered that I started almost 15 years ago um, was my own holiday, which is One World Orgasm uh -huh. Day, uh -huh. um, which is August 8th every year. Um, the goal is sort of to invite the entire world to have an orgasm that day and hope for peace and love and whatever. But I'm kind of very playful about it. It was funny because after I set that up, about six years later, somebody else basically copied the entire website that I did. They even had the same oh. questions like why, where, whatever. They were a little bit more serious about that we're going to bring world peace. Uh -huh. I don't actually think even if we had all orgasms, I don't think we're going to have world peace. But uh -huh. I, you know, it would distract us for a day. Uh, but I've been doing that for 15 years and just kind of getting the word out there for people to do it. And, and that's August 8th. Yeah. It's World yeah. Orgasm Day, which yeah. is, this this show is August 4th, so that's in four days. In four days after right. this so show. You're Make urging sure you everybody to go out and have an yes. orgasm? Yeah. Right? With, with someone, by yourself, whatever it takes, you know. Um, it was funny because when I first... Um, did it and I posted a page on my website at that time I got an email about six months later from uh, Arthur C. Clarke and I thought yeah right sure Arthur C. <laughs> Clarke um, and after doing a little bit of research I found uh, I checked I checked information that it, it really was Arthur C. Clarke and he was um, he wrote me because his secretary told him about One World Orgasm Day and he um, had written a story, I think he said 40 years earlier, or something like that, uh, which I can't think of the title right now. Um, Love Saves the Day, I think, uh, about a similar situation. The world is in some kind of danger, or meteorite, something's going to happen, and the solution that the scientists have come up with is that everyone, at that point I think they, they called it make love or something, because they wouldn't have suggested orgasms, but the idea was that if everyone had an orgasm, it would save the, save the world. So uh -huh. it, was, it was fascinating. I still saved the email from Arthur C. Clarke. <laughs>